Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Burning Desire Show. And today I'm with uh, Michelle Chan. I've pronounced that correctly, surely. Yeah, Michelle Chan, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sh- I, in the prequel, I, I should always ask how to pronounce names, but I always forget to do that. But um, That's anyway, all right. yours, is, yours is pretty simple to pronounce, right? Um, yes. And so I was saying to you just prior to, the, to, the, to this that um, I came across... So, so the broad conversation today is all about Montessori um, education techniques and the schools and what that means. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people may not have come across it. I never heard of it before. I think I was saying to you, I think I listened to a podcast possibly and someone in, in the technology community mentioned that they sent their kids to Montessori schools and they were talking a bit about it. And I thought that's pretty interesting. And I'm that inquisitive sort of guy that always has to find out more than just Googling online. So then I came across you and um, hopefully you can give us some insight into that as well as your your general kind of story as well, which would be interesting. Yeah, oh, cool. <laughs> great, great. So um, I, I, I like to take it back to kind of school days. Like you, you, you grew up in Hong Kong, is that correct? Yeah, I grew up in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, were were you like a, in school? You, did, you went to a normal school, I presume, not a Montessori school. Normal traditional school. <laughs> yeah. And so were you like studious? Did you get good grades? Like what sort of a student were you at that point? Um, well, the teachers always find me difficult because um, uh, I, well, I have lots of energy. I still have lots of energy. Um, so I was very chatty all the time. You know, yeah. at a traditional school that you, you sit on your own table. I always talk to the neighbors <laughs> <laughs> and always... Got my, I'm, I, well, they always did like, like this girl talk too much and then can't sit still and disturb the, the rest of the class. So that makes sense. But you, you, get, you, got, you got decent grades though in school? Um, yeah, we got grades, you know, and of course, you know, you know, I'm always kind of in the middle, not okay. always the top. Like some friends always the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you find, did school come like naturally to you or you had to work at, like at it in terms of like to get the grades? Oh, you have to work hard, you know, to, to get the grades. And I remember when I, because my parents are there, not very highly educated. So since we were kind of primary three, my mom, uh, she can't really teach, you know, follow up, basically it's follow up the homework anymore. So she sent us to kind of tutorial class. Someone just basically take care of, you know, check our homework, but you still have to work hard. Most of the thing is that's why you did it by yourself. And then, you know, normal class, normal school and everything's normal. I don't know how it works in Hong Kong, but I, I presume is it when you're 17, 18, do you decide to go to university and, and specialise in, in the subject? Is that how it works there? Yes, very similar because, uh, you know, Hong Kong is, well, was the British economy. We followed the system where I did the A-level. Then before the A-level, you know, uh, I need to choose what subjects. I remember I got 20 options. And I always loved history. I still love history. So I put quite a lot, you know, not many universities have options for, you know, taking history, maybe four. And so the rest, you just randomly, because I know I don't like business. So it's very hard for me to find those random options. But the funny thing is, I find out is at the end of the day, because that time, you know, when, how do you know which um, option you got is your open, that day, that day, you go and buy a newspaper. So you open, yeah, when you read a newspaper, there's a special code to tell you which course. When I just like read it, I like, oh, what course was that? Mine was 13. So imagine when you put 13, you would have not thought about it, you would get the 13. So my degree, yeah, was uh, political science. <laughs> so, so in your, in your A-levels, you did history. What else did you study? I did a uh, Chinese literature, yeah, history, Chinese literature, and then, then one, are there three AS subjects? One is Chinese, Chinese and English is compulsory anyway, you don't have a choice. And the other one is liberal studies, I think is in human relationship and environmental studies. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then you study at University of Hong Kong, uh, a Bachelor of Arts in Social Science, Government and international studies, right? Yes. And and what what like what are you learning in that kind of like uh, that course? Um, it's very interesting. Like, cause because I study uh, history, 
So it's not like just like kind of world history. You study about the UK history, you study about, you know, about Indian history, you study about Chinese history plus the Japanese history. So kind of mixture of different kind of history. And when you, and then I study Chinese literature as well. So that's part of it. You need to study, you know, how, how the literature have been changing, you know, through a different time of dynasty. Mm -hmm. So when a uni, it's just like, there's a course, it's kind of combination, like different kind of ideology compared to West and the East. And so it's not something like unfamiliar and very similar to history. It's just like from another perspective that when you will look at something more in a political term, like kind of what is Willism, what is liberalism and what is nationalism, those kind of things, they're not new, but it's just like you study more in depth yeah. in political science. Yeah, that makes sense. And did you, when you were doing the degree or before the degree or slightly after the degree, did you have a specific career in mind as to what you were trying to, to do? I thought I was going to continue my master's degree and do a PhD because the reason I chose history because I always wanted to be a teacher. So the, because in political science, that is very difficult. Like you don't really have a subject to teach in Hong Kong, you know. So anyway, I remember that moment I talked to um, some people and talked to my professor. I said, if something that you would really want to pursue as career, so maybe you can consider to take the master. So that moment I was thinking to be, a, you know, maybe take a PhD in political science at some point. Yeah, but change. Um, why change and what I brought up to Montessori is, uh, I remember there was an internship program, I think it's called Metropolitan Program, Exchange Program. Um, so I spent, I think kind of a month, you know, working internship in Atlanta, US. Wow. So at wow. that point, I met my coordinator, Juliana, and then find out, I met Montessori children. Her child was studying Montessori, you know, school. That why that's why I come up with Montessori. I yeah. see. I see. So what what were you doing? Uh, what was the actual um, program in Atlanta that you were, you were you were on? It's a very intensive course. So um, it talks about you know who you know Dr. Montessori was. You know, is an Italian doctor. So literally, he was, she was a you know doctor, physical doctor, and then the loss of um, I always say. That study, that diploma is more difficult and more challenging than A level <laughs> because it changed, it changed lots of your thoughts about education, especially when I study from a traditional, you know, educational background. Then the not something is new. It's just like every day you feel like there's a wave, you know, throwing to your face something new. You, heard, you, you never heard about it. It's very, very. It's a very inspiring course, but it's, you have to, I will have to work very, very hard. So just do something, so, so you, went to, did you, you went to Atlanta to study Montessori or while you were in Atlanta, you saw Montessori, which, which was the trip? I came to, well, I came to London to study the Montessori diploma. No, no, sorry, Atlanta, when you went, sorry. you went to Atlanta, right? Was it Atlanta? Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. I so, went to Atlanta to do an internship program for a month. Okay, what was the internship were you doing? Um, so basically, I remember like working for um, kind of an e-commerce company, try to work on, that was the first time I got in touch with Google. Okay. <laughs> try to find about like kind of different kind of search engine. So let's say you type certain words. So what kind of things that you, you know, you came up with. And, yeah. Okay. It's quite interesting. And, while, and you said, whilst we were there, the person running the program, her child was a Montessori child. And that's where you yes. came, came across this new, like, new... Yeah, uh... because I got on well with her, very okay. well. So later on, you know, um, so I talk about, like, you know, the career path. So she's, that is why she suggests, um, if you're really into education, why don't you have a look at monster education? Mm -hmm. And the child was Comerio. Um, and then, so she told me about Montessori and I start to look for information and I found that's kind of thing, something that I missed when I was a child. <laughs> I wish someone would understand me. So I just thought, oh, wow, it's very, 
it's very inspiring. So that's sort of the reason I just decided to take the course. Great. So where, where did you take the course in Montessori? Where's the first course you took? Uh, in London, Hampstead. So, you, so you, you're you in Atlanta. You went, Did you go back to Hong Kong and then you decided yes. to go to London? No, no. I, so I, you know, you know, did internship in Atlanta, went back, and then I still have to, I think I have one and a half years to finish the study oh, okay. anyway. So finish the study and then still looking for the career path. Um, then kind of around two years later, so I decided to take the course. Yeah. Quite amazing to uh, to move to London to take a course there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there, there was there just, there just no, there was, it didn't exist, obviously, in Hong Kong at that time. I presume it, it's... No, it doesn't exist. Like, um, there are certain, you can find, because uh, the course I did is through, uh, it's called AMI, Association Monastery International. So there are different kinds of centers. You can study different, like, maybe Philippines, you can study in Japan, you can study, I'm not sure about Korea at that time. Um, that time, it wasn't very popular in Asia. Mm -hmm. So there are not many, you know, training centers you can take. And then plus some will say like Australia will say, oh, we have a course, we can offer a course, but we cannot get a visa for you. Mm. So you need a visa, there's a lot of things anyway. Um, yeah, London. Yeah. So how long was your course in London? Well, technically it's nine months from September to the following June, but mm -hmm. I remember it's April, actually we had exam. <laughs> Okay. So it's a very very intensive course. Yeah. And so can you can you tell again? I I know a little bit about Montessori, but can you tell explain to us the, like the background? It was Maria, was it Maria Montessori? The, yeah, Maria Montessori. Um, so she was the first Italian medical doctor, and I think the that point, you know, kind of inequality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So she was really like kind of rejected, you know, to be accepted by the male students or whatever. And so she did lots of, you know, studies basically on her own in the evening. And then I think what brought up to her is, can't remember exactly, but it just like, I think kind of after the World War time that there's a need, like lots of people, they lost their parents. And so she was just trying, at what, she developed is she did lots of observation and then she tried to work with different people and talk to different people like maybe education background and to see what's the best for her children those children imagine either no parents or very poor so this group of people is basically under her care for a long period of time mm -hmm. and she find out well you know these children work better and concentrate better as long as you know we engage them so is it like it's very really different from nowadays that you have to have a, have a toy and yeah but how long does a child engage with a toy so people will say if you go to a monastery classroom they still talk say toys we don't say toys we either say work or we say activities because there are different things it's like what she, she combined her observation with, I think, her medical background. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things like if you do three to six, it's lots of hands-on hands -on activities because we find out now, the more you use your hands, it's connected to your brain. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things like that's why she had a, um, a space on that. And then she think like the more senses you, you use to learn something, let's say, when a child doesn't know how to speak yet, like toddler. So let's say you give her a pen. So you tell the child, this is a pen. So usually the child, they may lick it, they may smell it, they may touch it. So different kinds of senses are using at the same time. So that's a section of activities we call sensorial. Basically, they isolate each sense at the same time. So the child will only see, let's say we have color tablets, the tablets are all identical. The only difference is the color. So the child will see only the color and then you play the game, pairing, grading, different kinds of games. It's related to later math because math is about you know, pairing, grading, you know, finding a difference, whatever. So it's very, very interesting. It's, and I always find it's very hard 
to talk about Montessori is such a short period of time because it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, yeah, yeah. So it, what, what age does the Montessori um, education start? Is it the same as like a, a nursery would start or is it a bit later or what age group they normally start? Some, actually some will start from zero to 18. But I think in the UK, you might always see uh, from the toddler group and then maybe up to um, we call elementary, maybe like 12. In US, uh, even here you will have a needle or like baby glass. It depends on the nursery. Maybe starting at the old nursery I used to work with, um, they offer like maybe from three months old to ex, you know, the age of seven. In US, you will have more. They will do um, up to elementary, up to 12. You might see they call adolescence course, but because the need is different. And so, yeah, the loss of integrated things happening at the same time. And so basically it's to cover that, but because also people, they don't really understand um, how does it work? Or some parents were concerned, oh, if I, my child started a Montessori, let's say a secondary school, high school, whether the child can come up with the normal traditional yeah. background. So there's always lots of controversy over there. Um, I studied my master degree in Loyola about two years ago. So I talked to more people and that but it's quite interesting, you know, to see how monastery education, you know, can be allocated and then how intensive and how integrated. Because one of the things that she suggests is about having a farmhouse. The reason is when you study a farmhouse, basically you have to grow the products. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things like when you study, way now when we study about science, do we separate, you know, physics, biology and chemistry? Yeah. But in real life, she always connected with real life. When you let's say you grow a plant, so you need to know how much sunlight, how much water, how much fertilizers. Those are things is in real life is all integrated. You can't separate them to three subjects. Mm. And then through the product, because she feel like you need to give meaning to those adolescents, so that how they feel the meaning of it, they need to earn money. So by selling the product, they feel that, you know, they feel the value and it has to be validated. So it's very interesting anyway. <laughs> so it's like a more of an end to end education, in real world studies. Yeah, than yeah. She always emphasized on real life experience. And and this is what, what we need. And you might you know, have heard about a lot of, you know, employers complain, you know, this person you know, they did well academically, but in reality, like a part of social interaction part of people, they might know, don't know how to interact. Children, when they're young, so we teach them something called grace and courtesy lessons. Then what it meant was just like kind of the social interaction. Let's say in the morning, you say good morning, you greet people. And then what if you want to get past, you need to say, excuse me, you know, how to, not just about language, it's just like how, let's say how to carry a chair in the room. So about safety. And so there are different things, like even you can see um, how to turn a page of the book so that you can make sure the book is not torn. <laughs> and so there's lots of things that go, it's very, it's very interesting. Like she, uh, she, she was definitely amazing. And what she was, talking about like it was imagine like she died many years ago and then she was so far you know we were so behind compared to she was so advanced yeah wow. I, how do you find well there's two things i'm thinking in, in the uk what did do you have montessori high schools or, or is it more nursery and preschool in the uk at this point? i think more pre uh, more kind of you know, nursery i think there's some we call elementary, like mm -hmm. this is primary school, um, but not much. Yeah, not many. Mostly uh, it's like younger. So how, how do these children, your experience, like deal with going from the Montessori kind of method and then going into traditional school? Like, are they more advanced than the kids that um, are in traditional education? Do they struggle with the, the, 
the discipline maybe or, or the different way of teaching? How do mm -hmm. um, so this is the question parents always want to know. So it's a very common question. Um, so here, uh, children usually they will leave the nursery four or four and a half because once it's paid and unpaid, basically it's like that. Um, so if a child, let's say, finished a six years course, because um, when I was working in Shanghai, so what we have, we will do something like kind of transition transition period. So what I did last year was I got five or six graduates. So we help them have a group. We talk about, okay, what are we going to do when we go for interview? So what are you going to, you know, you cannot just like walk in without saying anything. So you, you need to give them those kind of skills and they can practice like in a group as well. And then you need to let them understand Rules are different. In a Montessori school, basically, your friend, you know what to do. Like you, you have given the freedom to explore. You're given the free freedom, you know, to talk to other people. You need to let them know the rules are different. Mm -hmm. and, and then explain to them. So that's kind of usually the last, the last of transition. Then you need to let the children know and it works. They are, yeah, there are several parents give me the feedback is their children are fine. I work with someone like in Hong Kong and even here, four and four and a half. They are very advanced compared to normal children and they're bored. Because some children, I remember one child um, I used to teach is Isabel. I still keep in touch with the family. We became a family now. <laughs> She's 18. She read when she was four and a half. So imagine four and a half, not many children will read in a traditional school. And some were just like quite advanced doing like maybe addition using materials we call maybe golden bees. So basically you can count. So for them, some children find it difficult to do transition, but we always prepare them what happened when you go to a primary school it's not about what you say it's about what the teacher <laughs> tells you to do and once you give them the preparation i always say that the preparation like if you go to a, let's say you go to a toy shop if you just does if you don't say anything the child would grab all the toys but if you tell them we just come here we just look for something so children are fine as a preparation Wow, so interesting. So if someone didn't, like, say you had one classroom that's a Montessori classroom, one that is a, a, a not traditional classroom, what ob observationally for like a, you know, a lay person going, looking at what's going on, what would be the key differences between like a traditional kind of nursery and like a Montessori nursery? Um. I think as an observer, there are lots of things you need to prepare yourself. I haven't really been observed, you know, in a traditional school. Um, but, uh, you know, be observer, you need to know what you observe. Let me use the um, example, because parents do come and observe their child. If you just let them come, they will see all the weakness of the class. They were trying, oh, why the teacher doesn't do that? Why they don't do that? Why do they do that? So if you give them a list, so let's say, um, what do you think great about this classroom? About the environment? How is the social interaction among the children? What is the atmosphere? So I think is even as a monastery teacher for so many years, I'm still learning is I need to um, kind of, Whenever you observe, you need to change your glasses <laughs> mm -hmm. and to see what goes well. You need to, you know, if not, it's a, I think it's a human tendency to look something bad. This is, I will, I will say, if you go to, and then sometimes you will have lots of questions because as an observer, if you don't understand what you observe, and then you will very, quick to jump the conclusion. 
happen because you turn you train yourself okay what happened why so you will pay more attention and you will be more patient to follow up and see what's going on one of the examples let's say we might hear children fighting but some teachers might see the actual act they're fighting but some teachers might be able to see what happened before maybe a child will come and say something another child is not happy that's why it, you know you need to sometimes it's very hard to see the whole picture but as an observer you need to empty your mind not to jump to conclusion too too quickly and it's a it's a very difficult process i will say that way do i answer your question yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I... When I was looking into the Montessori kind of education, the thing that struck me or, or that kind of seems to be a key underpinning is to allow the child to to lead and, and, and be inquisitive on their own and curious about whatever it is and let them kind of um, find their own way rather than being prescriptive. Like today we're learning this, this is what we've got to do. Is, is that true? Is that what kind of happens? Um. Let me say that way. When I was finished the training, usually um, it's true like we, we will ask, like let's say a three-year-old want to do something, a six-year-old, you know, activity. In your heart, of course, it's no. <laughs> but you need to find a way, let's say, whether the child exploring, maybe some children just want to touch. Some people just want to look. They might want to, they might not want to work with it. So there's certain ways you have to be careful to direct a child. You say, yeah, you can have a look at it. This is what is it for? Explain to the child. Let's say the child wants to do subtraction with bees. And we were thinking, you know, I had, I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> the child, you, 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 the worst scenario, you, ex, you, you expect it just like the bees, you know, will be everywhere. So in order to stop that, you need to think ahead. Tell, guide a child, this is what is it for. But what I would do is just like, if in order to do that, you need to do so many things before that. So explain to the child, one day you will get there. But you have to do this, 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 and that. And then go and guide the child to the appropriate age activities. Usually the child is fine. Yep. So this is the way some people have a misunderstanding about, oh, follow the child. And does it mean that the child is free to do whatever? No, <laughs> it's, it doesn't mean like that. A child's new to a monastery classroom, there are lots of we call ground rules, such as you can't shout, you can talk softly. This is one of the great ways and courtesy lessons. Teacher Tao, you need to talk softly. You can talk and, you know, the design of the classroom is only one material in the class. So you need to teach the child to take turns. Tell the child, I know you wouldn't want to do this one. If you wouldn't want to do this, you have to wait. So there's lots of preparation before the child is realized you've, there's nothing like they're free to do whatever they want. It's, under, it's with limits. We also And it's always under guidance. I always, I, from my experience, I like to see the child go and explore according to their interests. If the child is working on it, not mess, we, we say it's not messing around. They just want to touch it. They just want to see it. You always keep an eye on them. Usually maybe a minute or two, because it's very difficult anyway. They will just put it back. So this is you know, how it works. If you tell them, oh, you're not ready, we don't want to give an impression the child like you kind of just like judging them you're not ready though you know you know the child is not ready but you we don't say it so you have to be very careful to guide the child to do something age appropriate things and you can show them or giving them a choices why don't we do a or b now what do you think so usually the child will be happy to follow instructions are the Montessori classrooms in terms of the number of children, how do they compare to a traditional uh, nursery or school? Are they similar sized classrooms, smaller, larger? 
the number of students? Mm. It depends on countries. <laughs> like London is for, um, the ratio is one to eight. So for three to six and then toddler, 18 months to maybe two and a half is one to four. And then babies, of course, you know, is one to three, the ratio is there. Um, I think in Hong Kong, maybe one to 12. Can't, maybe, um, I think probably in China, something like that. And, but personal experience, less adults is best. First is communication issues. Imagine you have 16 children in one class. I used to work with the toddler program. So you have to, that, that means there will be four adults. So it, every little tiny thing, communication is always an issue. Something happens so fast, you wouldn't have time to talk to the colleague. And then because so many adults is a, is a child's tendency to rely on the adults instead of trying to help to solve the problem by themselves. So that is, I would say, how it is. Am I, yeah. That makes sense. And in terms yeah. of the, the kind of parents that you deal with in Montessori schools, um, what kind of background is it across the whole like socioeconomic spectrum? Are they generally wealthier parents? Are they more business people? Is, is, is there a whole mix of people that kind of um, mm. send the kids to these schools? Um, they need to have some money on this way. Because it's not, it's expensive, unfortunately. It is, it is expensive. It just the mat monastery materials itself are expensive. Um, but some, I think the UK government, they offer um, nursery grant up to, I think two years old now. So certain hours. So some nurseries, they are quite flexible and they were happy to offer. And some parents are extra, I work with some parents extremely, you know, worthy. And some, but most people, they're quite high, highly educated. Let me say that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most high, yeah, mo like in Shanghai and Hong Kong, they're quite highly educated. I used to work for some parents, they work, you know, they are kind of VP of banks or they own the school, they, not they own the school, they own their own business. And yeah. That makes sense, that makes sense. Mm. Um, and do you find you've taught, obviously, I think you said in Hong Kong, Shanghai and London, is that correct? Yes. And it is are the techniques the same, uh, no matter what the country. How how, how are the kids do the kids respond differently in, in the different different countries, or is it is it individual based on the child themselves? Um, I think the culture is very different. China tend to be quite protect quite protective. Um. Um, Hong Kong is more like independent, but I'm sure you heard about something called helicopter parents. They're quite mm. like looking at eye on you all the same time and quite pushy and demanding. I think it's China, well, because I work with Shanghai. So similar like that. Um, London, it depends. Some parents, they will just focus on, you know, as long as they're happy every day, as long as I see progress but some can be demanding. Like I work with different nationalities. I work with Russians, I work with German, I work with Italian, I work with Chinese, I work with Japanese. Everyone is different. And it really, I think it depends on their own upbringing and their kind of perception about education. And so, yeah, it, it depends. But one thing, I, one thing is important is as a teacher, as a monastery teacher, you need, to let the parents know and educate them why you're doing it. Like in the UK, probably people will send the child to a monastery school because they're around the corner. Sure. Not really because of monastery school. It's just always, oh, I heard it's a good school around the corner. I just enroll my child. Mm -hmm. It happens in um, Hong Kong as well, because um, kind of um, for it, one of the quite successful bilingual school teach Chinese and English in a monastery way. So lots of parents, they were always, oh, they just expect move to Hong Kong. Oh, I heard about this school. I want my child to learn Mandarin. Mm -hmm. I want my child to enroll it. 
So there's the different kinds of different kind of reasons. And most parents, you need to educate them and then let them know what you're doing, what help the child to to learn and to grow according to their you know uh, potentials. Yeah. There's a lot of work about parenting. Yeah. No, that's that's super interesting. Um I think it's covered quite a lot of what I um what I was thinking about. Um and it's given me a good kind of understanding as to the differences and, and kind of um what what it's all about. Um if it was up to you, how would you like incorporate the Montessori into say like higher education? So like how would that work within say secondary school and also into like universities like how, how would that um play out there compared to traditional or would you keep the education from how it is in your opinion i don't really understand your meaning can you so, say again so yeah. monstrous as i understand it is more for early stage education mm. but from what you've seen and how you how one story works how would you or would you even change the later education so university education would that work in a Montessori way or is it best for early stage education mm. I think the so what Dr Montessori is she thinks about she thought about education is an aid to life so what education is about you think about it we spend nearly 20 years in education before we go into society and I remember there was a discussion with my own professor when I was doing my university studies. They always want children to be independent, to have critical thinking instead of, I'm not sure is it because my study is, was political science. So they, expect, they expected us you know, to speak up, to express themselves, this is what those kind of elements then I always say kind of invisible abilities, concentration, confidence, you know, how to interact with other people. This is what elements actually we still need nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so I don't always think it's about just early years, but we do believe once you have a very good foundation, the three to six, because she was thinking like, Kind of four planes of development so each development will have something that will have their focus so once but three to six are kind of zero to six is a very fundamental once you establish well the child will flourish by itself i got a parent i got a student it's called joshua mm -hmm. uh, when i was in hong kong joshua joshua is, is gifted <laughs> When he was, he came to my class, he was three, he was three and a half. <clears throat> he knew how to read Chinese and English already. Mom, mom is a, a English, you know, professor in the university, but is very down to a very humble lady. We still, you know, keep in touch with, we get on very well. And uh, so as a gifted child, yes, intellectually, he's very, very bright. There's no problem. But in terms of socially, in terms of um, his, we call fine motor and gross motors, those kind of skills, he's very weak. So what I did, I remember the first year, because I knew the child's strength and I knew the child's weakness. The first year, what I did is I didn't teach him any reading. He knows already. So I, I teach a child is, something you need to work on because your motor, your, your motor skills are not good. So he did lots of, you know, cutting, fine motor skill, like for the whole year, you know, do lots of, we call practical library, just like basically you hands-on experience, like how to wash a table, how to, you know, uh, pour, pouring without getting any spills, lots of things he would spend a whole year <laughs> until yeah. I felt, okay, this child's ready. And then he, but you still have to keep on building the child's empathy and sympathy. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things is very important nowadays, even, you know, as an adult, 
So, you know, how to respect other people. He did something very fast because he's very intelligent anyway. So I said to him, yes, you did fast, but you have to wait for other people too. So by this kind of, you know, daily learning, the child will pick it up. Okay, it's not just about me. It's about others too. You know, it's life is always about others, not just about you. It's how you cooperate with others in a bigger setting. Mm -hmm. So those kind of values, once the child has established well, then we keep on, because you keep on repeating, you think about it, you know, when you're at primary school, when you're at high school, and you're, it's the same. So there's, I will, I will put it that way. It just, Dr. Montessori was so in advance that she, people thought that kind of skill should be learned in university, but actually we, they should learn when they're little. So it's this kind of fundamental values should be established when they are. I think it's a really good place to leave the chat today, Michelle. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, it's been really interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. It's really nice to chat with you as well. <laughs> it's cool. Um, I, I guess the, the answer to the question is probably simple, but if someone's in, interested in the, from listening to this or watching this um, about the Montessori, is the best way to just Google around and, and try and find a school or a, a teacher or tutor nearby? Is that the best thing to do? Um. If you if you ask me, it's the it's the best way is to go back to Dr. Montessori box, because still like after working for at least fifteen years, so I did my master kind of two years ago in Loyola, and then recently I am taking a trainer program, so to teach teachers, well adults learners, mm -hmm. I'm still learning, and every time when you go back to the, we always still go back to the doc, to the box Dr. Mom's already written so many years ago. That is the best way because you read her books, you know what she meant. But of course, it's, it's difficult to understand. It's because most of the time she doesn't really read the book, it's most of the time, and then she, it's a speech, you know, she gave it to audience and then it's Italian and people translate to English. So that also translation could be missing. Um, but I think it's good to talk if that is easier that you can talk to someone like myself have been in a, in a monastery field for a long time and have to be very careful about internet resources. Some people, they don't really understand what it meant. And re yesterday, well, not yesterday, I had an online lecture with uh, one of the trainers in US that, you know, when we now look at Pinterest, lots of people say, oh, it's a Montessori. But it's not a Montessori at all. But because we know what, because we have been working, you know, we, because even as an as a adult, it took years for us to transform. You know, what it meant every time you still face something challenging. Mm -hmm. So some people just like pick it up and thought, oh, this monastery is for commercial purpose. It's very sad. <laughs> or you can talk to someone like trainers. That would be a good idea as well. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, really, uh, really appreciate the chat today. Yeah, me too. It's great opportunity to talk to you. So thanks, Charles. Very fun.